you will have to forgive me for my uh, my voice like like this. Hmm. I can't read my own slides from, from this distance. This isn't so good. But I can read them up there. Okay. Um, I came from. I too came from theoretical physics sort of background before I became an um, entrepreneur. Or, or rather, before I recognized that I was an entrepreneur, before I went to university, I'd already founded three, co three companies, which might have given perceptive people a clue, but I was totally oblivious to this at all. I thought I was a physicist. So, um, you know, it means I like graphs, and I like presenting things, and a lot of what we are doing is um, easier to visualize on a two-dimensional axis than on a... Um, one-dimensional axis, which is sort of how we kind of talk about things. Difference between big companies and small companies. The difference between complicated things and simple things and stuff like this. So Charles Perro, who is a professor of sociology at Yale, emeritus now, and one of my um, personal heroes, um, wrote a book in the 70s called Normal Accidents. And normal accidents is about why things blow up. Um, so for, for years, for more than a decade, whenever anything blew up in the United States, there'd be Charles Perrow or one of his students trying to figure out why this thing happened, you know? And so he studies catastrophes and things like this. And he discovered that most catastrophes happen because there's a component failure. Something failed and something bad happened. And it was not in any way unexpected at all. But a lot of them happened a significant number of them happened for ways that were mysterious for all people involved. And um, those are things he calls normal accidents or system accidents. And that is two or more systems in your, in your operation, which weren't really intended to interact with each other, did, producing results that were really perplexing for the people, for the people involved and um, you know, with catastrophic potential and sometimes ca catastrophic happenings. So that's what, a, that's what a normal accident is, and that's what the book Normal Accidents is about, and it's about this. Now, the way, the way he's divided things up, and, and the important thing here is, you notice it's on a graph, but you notice there aren't any numbers on the axis. This is not a, this is not a quantitative study in rigor. This is a qualitative study on how to visualize your problem. So um, on the top, there's tightly coupled things and loosely coupled things. And on the bottom, there are, and, and, and that's just the coupling of how the process in whatever you're doing happens. And on the bottom, we have interactions, which are linear and expected, or complex and unexpected. So, and then he just plunked in all the things that he'd studied and things like this on things like, to put them up and things like this. He did this in the 70s, so power grids are fairly not complex and under, unexpected. The Americans then deregulated their, their electricity ag agency and now things in the power grid business are a whole lot more unexpected than they were when he made the chart. So, but it's just, it's just I mean, just take, to take a look at these things, you will discover that, I mean, there's a difference between ways universities operate and the ways a drug manufacturing thing operates. But the important thing is tightly coupled things Um, mistakes in one area can easily spread to another area, cascade, and get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So if you have a problem in a tightly coupled area, what you really need is centralized authority, real obedience. You need everybody to know what the procedures are, do them, and fix the problem in a hurry. Um, which means you had better understand what the problem is and how they can interact. And if things are really linear, you do. So, so I mean, dams could kill a lot of people, but generally aren't all that because the in interactions are linear and expected, and so no matter how tightly coupled it is, when something goes bad, you do the right thing. On the other hand, we have things like universities and R&D institutes and things like this. The interactions are all unexpected, but if something goes wrong, you have plenty of time to sit and scratch your head and say, oh, I wonder why that happened. Let's go think about it for a while. And um, so they produce decentralized structures where everybody has their own authority and people with specialized knowledge get to come in and say their own little bits, and they get the sort of structures that they want. And for Perro, of course, the problem is up in the, in the, in the corner because um, where things like Three Mile Island nuclear plants and stuff like this happen are where things are both tightly coupled 
and complexly interactive. Because, um, because they're tightly coupled, they demand a centralized structure with efficient processes, um, efficient in terms of command processes, authoritarian processes. And because they're complex interactivity, they, they demand things to be decentralized and loosely coupled. The demands are, are completely unreconcilable, and that's what makes these things dangerous. So, you know, if you think in terms of this, you sit there and say you can sort of model most of the world this way. And one of the things I've been doing was modeling um, new sectors in global marketing and what kind of stuff there were. And I was putting on lists and thinking this was terrific. And then in 2009, Charles Perrault himself came up and did exactly the same thing. And could I have my next slide, please? Is there a, oh, there's a, yeah, there's something. Okay. So, in the, in, the, in the real world now, cell one is generic markets. That's what, what economists generally say when they say they're a market. This is, what, this is what a market is. Up until 1970, practically every business on the planet was in there, and there weren't any other sectors to worry about. Lots of business, lots of competition, nothing's particularly too complicated or hard to understand. And generally, things move then up to cell four, which is concentration. This is when one of the business becomes a monopoly or they get hardly any businesses in there and they can really, really tighten up the coupling, which generally means they can reduce costs and they can lay off people if, that's, if that also is good and they make more profits and things like this. And this was sort of the model. This is what businesses are supposed to do. But now, we are actually in the business of doing things that where that kind of efficiency isn't what we want. We want to be able to do things more thoroughly. We want to be able to do things that react unexpectedly and things like this. And one of the neat things we got with the web, which not everybody um, expected at the time, was a way to loosely couple things. So you'd have a mix here and a whole bunch of people would show up and, uh, and you would be able to get, get things coupled together. The secret to the loose coupling here is something called uh, modular contracting which is as opposed to relational contracting. Relational contracting is when you're a big supplier of somebody like you know, Airbus or, a, or an auto oil manufacturer, and you, you sit there and say, good, I will control my suppliers very, very well, and we'll have a really close relationship with them, and we'll produce things. I'll train them really, really well to make the sort of components I need, and through this strong relationship with each other, we'll all prosper together. And that can really work. It doesn't generally work all that well in the IT department. I mean, it, if, you're, if, you're, if you're making components, if you're making things that you can drop on your foot, this may be where you want to belong as an entrepreneur. But since we're talking about IT entrepreneurship, I am telling you that almost all of the great developments and everything are in something which economists and sociologists call um, modular contracting. And modular contracting is, you take the complexity, you put it in a package, and you do all of the stuff in there, and you don't let it spread. Communicate through the outside through an interface, an API, what have you, and, and then you let people randomly shuffle these modulars, modules together and things like this, and you can get all sorts of interesting things at the other end that you never would have expected in the first time because you don't have to explain it. You don't have a linear sequence of how these things have to go in any order. You have a whole series of APIs, and anybody's free to toss them together any way you like. So this is what we are talking about, and if you're talking about um, let's improve things for the entrepreneurs, it is necessary to know that what you want to do is to improve things for modular um, contracting, because that's where the IT business is, rather than, you know, how, teach, you know there's a lot of how to improve your business things that are designed for different kinds of businesses, and they won't do you any good. Next thing. Oh, let's skip that. Um, and I'm not, I, I have this, but I can talk about this for a great deal, but I think we would rather um, have, have, have more time for, for conversations. So what do we want to do to encourage the, the, level, the level three companies we've got? One, we want open standards. And normally I talk about this a lot, but I think absolutely everybody here already knows that we want open standards, so I don't have to talk about this. Second, we badly need to recognize that this is what we're doing. A great deal of, of, of what we of problem when we're trying to develop this in Europe is that um, we pretend that we're, we're trying to manufacture shoes. And we don't have any idea that this is what we are trying to do, so we don't actually support the stuff that's actually creating the new value. And uh, an awful lot of money we waste 
um, in um, um, traditional businesses that would like to become monopolies, which is not where new value is being created, so it isn't going to do us any good. Um, one of the things that, uh, so we need, we need sort of recognition that this is where it is. So go off and spread, spread the word, tell everybody that you know that they need to find out what modular contracting is and that it's a good source of value and that maybe we should be supporting more of this. There are some positive signs. Um, uh, if you've ever been involved in a research program, and here the, you know, the FP7 research programs and things like this are, 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 are largely in terms of creating money for entrepreneurs, a colossal waste of money because they don't go to the entrepreneurs. The, you know, the typical members of an of a FP7 consortium and things like this are companies like SAP and large universities and things like this. And there aren't any entrepreneurs there. The entrepreneurs are not working for the large corporations and the entrepreneurs are not working in the universities. They've, they've all gone off and founded their own business. So it's not too surprising that if you don't hand any money to the entrepreneurs, you aren't actually doing anything to help the entrepreneurs in this particular fundraising activity. It may be okay for your research in general, but even that I've got some strong doubts with. Um, the Eurostars program, on the other hand, is actually really, really good because it recognizes that there are small research producing SMEs and hands them some money, and this is really good stuff. And a new phenomenon we have, which I wanted to mention, is crowdfunding. A lot of small co companies are just, you know, go off and get themselves a site somewhere and, um, Say, here are all these features, please give me money. And this is working. And one of the things we have to worry about is the tax agencies haven't paid a lot of attention to that. And they could actually kill this one dead in the water if they um, don't understand that what raising money this way is actually very, very valuable for the small companies and it, was, it is a good thing and we'd like to encourage it. They may just sit there and say, hmm, we should tax more. Um, let's see. There are other things that we could help with that. Better bankruptcy rules would help, would help small businesses a lot, but I'm over time, so I gotta stop. All right. We still have this. We have still have, we have still have the discussion. There's only one um, other thing that we really need to do, and that is that um, right now our schools are set up to send out MBAs, which are trained to administer large businesses of the sort that aren't, aren't creating the value that we're talking about. And um, it, would be a, it, would, it would not be difficult to tell our business schools, train entrepreneurs. But nobody seems to be doing that. They seem to think that the skills that, that it takes to administer a large company are applicable to entrepreneurship. And they're not. They're really not. 